Hello guys, how you doing today? I have Mr. Kevin Boyd here. He has a compelling story that he wants to share with you guys. How the Lord set him free from, you know, homosexuality and how the Lord uh, healed him from having full-blown AIDS. So his uh, story is very interesting, it's very fascinating. And I hope you guys will be blessed by, by his story and how the Lord is able to do all things how the Lord is able to help us and deliver us from our sins. So, um, Mr. Kevin Boyd, thank you, sir, for um, being part of this interview today. Um, if you would like to introduce yourself to my audience and tell them a little background about you and how the Lord um, saved you. Sure. So, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, greetings, everyone. I'm Kevin Boyd. I'm born and raised in Los Angeles. I am 57 years old, I'm single, no children, and career-wise, mm -hmm. I am a, a hair, hair artist of 38 years. And as far as my religious background, I have pretty much been in church my entire life, and I've uh, passed through pretty much all the major Christian denominations from Baptist, Kojic, Pentecostal, Apostolic, even non-denominational. So okay. I've had ex an experience in all, you know, all the denominations. Okay. Yeah. So when he said Kojic, he's talking about the Church of God in Christ, Inc., right, Mr. Boyd? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Were you born in uh, L.A. or did you move there? Because I know a lot of people move to L.A. Yeah, I was born, I'm, I'm born, I'm an L.A. native. I was born and raised in Los Angeles. Okay. And, and you said you got into the, um, so how was, how were you brought up? Were you brought up like in a two-parents household or was it like a single parent? So my family background, I grew up in, uh, I grew up, grew up in a middle-class neighborhood, uh, black families, and I had a small family. So my family just consisted of my mother, my father, and my brother. My brother is two years older. So we had a very small family. Okay. So like a, was, was it like a stable home? Because I know like even though you, some people grew up in a two-parent household, sometimes the home is not very stable. So like were your home relatively stable? Well, you know, to be honest with you, I think we had an image on the outside, but I think the inside didn't match the image on the outside. And I say that because uh, my mother was a, a devout Christian and she was very involved in church. And she was also uh, uh, an awesome elementary school teacher for like 35, 40 years. And so she appeared to be, you know, a, well, I, I wouldn't say appeared to be, but, you know, she was a great example of a woman and a mother. But the problem was my father was the complete opposite. And even as a kid, I used to wonder, how did she get stuck with him? Because he just did not compliment her in any way. So my father was a bartender and my mother was a school teacher. So my mother was home, of course, in the evenings, and my father was home during the day. And then he struggled also with drinking. And he also, you know, has some issues, you know, with, with uh, other women. So I just never understood what brought them two together because they were, they were completely different from what I saw. But I thank God for my mother because... My mother made us go to church. So church was engrafted in us, you know, from the, you know, from, from the very beginning. So I had a foundation. No matter what I went through, I had that foundation. So I thank God for my mother. Okay. So like what kind of church was it like a Protestant church or uh, what kind of church was you guys grew up in? Uh, so I grew up in a Baptist church, a, a pretty much traditional. Baptist Church. But when I became a teenager, 
you know, I, I realized there were other denominations and, you know, I was just curious, you know, was there more than just the Baptist church? So I started, you know, venturing out to different denominations, you know, and just kind of having my own journey, learning God, you know, having my own uh, walk with God, my own experience, you know, just besides what I grew up in. Yeah, uh, we, we from like when you go to church, cause like every church is different. Like, did you ever really, uh, were you just going to church because your parents was going to church, but did you ever have a relationship with God? Were you looking, searching for God? Cause some of us are searching and you know, but were you ever doing that? Or you were just going to church well, because your parents wanted you to go to church? Oh, I, absolutely, absolutely not. I mean, my mother, could only introduce me to church, but she can develop a relationship with God for me. So I had a relationship with God early on, but all the things in my life, you know, clouded it and made it complicated. So, you know, in the different denominations, you know, a, a particular de denomination is not a relationship with God. So it was just a, I guess it was just an experience and a learning journey you know, going through the different denominations, but I've always had a relationship with God. It's just that some of the things that happened to me in my life, you know, enter, uh, I, don't, I guess I could say interfered, you know, with that connection. Right. So what, what kind of lifestyle were you in? Like, did you like to go out, go to the club, or were you more like, uh, like, what were you into? Like, Well, to understand... To understand what I was into, I would have to tell you the story from the beginning, which is, although I grew up in church and everything, you know, I, I had a bad situation at home. Um, one day I was sick and it started when I was five years old. Uh, one day I had to come home from school because I had an extreme fever. And of course, my mother was at work. So my father had to take care of me. And even at the age of, of five, for some reason, I was excited because I felt like I get to spend some time with my father. Because remember, my father was an alcoholic, a womanizer, you know, and he wasn't a very nurturing kind of father. But this day, I was excited because I knew, you know, I would be home with just me and him. And so it was the beginning of the grooming process. And what happens a lot of times when kids are violated or abused or molested, the molester doesn't usually fall, fall out, molest them the first account. What they usually do is get the child comfortable. And then it's a process. And so that's what happened. Um, <clears throat> because of the fever, I had to take my clothes off. And when I took my clothes off, my dad said, lay on top of me. And as a, even at five years old, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking something doesn't seem right with this. Like, I don't think I'm supposed to be laying on top of my daddy naked, but it was the beginning, of, like I said, of a group, you know, of the grooming process that it escalated, you know, to touch here, touch there, touch there. And the thing was, of course, there were many times he was able to do it because, you know, as a kid, I am um, younger than everybody. So, of course, I got out of school before my brother. And, of course, I got home before my mother got home. So it was a perfect setup, you know, for him to say, come here, do this, do that. And over a period of time, you know, it progressed into do this, do that, you know. And so that was the beginning of the secret. But one of, one of the key components to all of this is that he always told me if I ever told anybody, he would kill me. And wow. so that kept me from ever telling anybody because I said there was so many times that I almost, I got really close to telling people and I, and I hear him in the background saying, you know, and uh, him saying, you know, I'm, uh, I'm going to kill you. And then I would clam up and be like, oh, no, forget it. I can't do it, you know. And, you know, so I suffered 
many years, you know, with the secret because I, I just didn't feel well, like you, I had a way out. Well, you know, only one that he was molested. Did he molest uh, your yeah. brothers and sisters? Yeah. Yeah, no, I only have a one brother, no sister, but he never touched my brother. We t we had a uh, we had a talk about it, and I I didn't see any signs of it. I don't think he touched him at all. Was it because he was old? Is your brother older than you? Two years older. Okay, but he never touched him any inappropriately. Uh, nothing. Wow. Nope. So. When you went through that experience, how did that change you? Because I know as a child, you know, if you were, you know, touched inappropriately, it's kind of like your brain is rewired. And then you kind of have a, you know, a distortion when it comes to sex. So how did that, you know, change you? I didn't realize it then, but, you know, as I got older, I put the pieces together. Uh, the fact that my innocence was taken and taken by my father, you know, it it had a, a, a it had a, a great impact on me because not just the sexual molestation, but I was missing fatherhood. I did not have a, a male role model. I did not have a leader role model. I did not have a father figure. So I didn't even know how to navigate with other men, other, other, you know, kids. So what happened was I only saw men as sexual objects because the only interaction I had with my father was sex. So I began to think that sex is love, which of course is not, but that was the only affection, the only attention that I got from my father. So I started to, you know, kind of, I guess, I don't, I guess you could kind of say like a band-aid or like a temporary fix. You know, I started being promiscuous in my teen years and I didn't realize I was, I was, uh, you know, looking for, I was looking for love in the wrong places. And so I became very promiscuous. But it got even worse in my young adulthood because I met my first uh, gay friend. So when you and say you became, you, when, I'm sorry, when you say you became very promiscuous, are you talking about with men or women? No, not women. Okay, well, no, 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 no. I just wanted to clear definitely, definitely not women. I mean, because I hadn't had any experience with a woman. That's what I'm saying because of what I experienced. I equated sex with love, uh, and and, um, and I saw men only as sexual objects. And so um, the whole thing is, the, another complication to the story is, in my entire life, from a child through my full adult years, I've always been in music ministry. So just imagine, I'm living in two worlds. You know, I'm living in my church world. And then when I get out of church, I'm living in my other world. So I just had a lot of spiritual torment, you know, a lot of confusion in my mind and in my life. So anyway, uh, moving on to my young adult years, I got even deeper into things because I met my first a uh, gay adult friend. So now he's introduced me to weed. He's introduced me to alcohol. He's introduced me to pornography. Um, back then, they had what they call cruising spots, and it's just a it's just a, a, a slang for local places. The guys go and pick up other guys, and <clears throat> so I'm introduced to been introduced to all these things. Is so it like a bathhouse? Like, uh, not necessarily a bath. No, I never went. I never did the bathhouse. Okay. It, it, it's, 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 I mean, like I said, it's called a cruising spot. So it's like local, local spots yeah. that guys go and pick up other guys. Not a bathhouse. I never did the bathhouse. Yeah. But it's just like certain areas 
you know that there's yeah. guys there that will, you know, it's just like a knowing, you you know, like parks, um, malls, you know, mm -hmm. you just kind of know, you make the eye contact and then you say, oh yeah, here, and then you go, you know, and you, you go and talk or, you know, go in the, in the parking lot and exchange numbers or, you know, follow them home or they follow you. So it's just, it's a whole nother world out there. But um, in the midst of doing all that, I just, I was never satisfied. I just felt like I was searching for something and I just didn't know what it was, you know? And so uh, to the extreme end of it, I started to believe that I was a gay Christian because I said, there's no way I can get out of this. You know, uh, I can't help how I am. You know, I guess this is just, you know, I'm this way because of what happened to me. So I just started to take on the false identity that Satan gave me. And so I stopped even, I stopped even considering deliverance. And so I just said I was a gay Christian. And then unfortunately, there was one time when I really was seeking deliverance and I had a bad experience in the church. At, at that time, I was uh, going to an apostolic church and my coworkers at the salon, they went to a different apostolic church and I really liked their church a lot. And so I said to myself, maybe I should join their church and, you know, get a fresh start and, you know, and possibly get some deliverance. Well, unfortunately, the girls in the salon, they had told the pastor that I was interested in joining the church. But they also told him about my lifestyle. So when I went in to meet the pastor, before I could sit down in the seat, he goes, you know, he knew that uh, our, our church is affiliated with, with each other. So he knew the church that I was coming from. So he said, are oh, you coming over there from such and such church? And I said, yes. He said, let me just tell you, if you're coming over here, we don't have no faggots over here. We don't have no sissies over here. So if you're coming over here with that, you might as well go on back over there. Wow. And it crushed me so bad because he had no idea I was coming for deliverance. Yes. So when he said when he said that, of course, I said, well, forget it. Let me, I'm never coming back here again. And so that that, you know, that took the wind out of my sail. And so uh, pretty much moving forward, you know, I just, I thrust myself all the way in and I said, well, I'm just a gay Christian, you know, and forget it. And I went as far as two things. I got so sexually um, entangled that I realized I had become a nymphomaniac. I thought about sex 24 seven and I said, I don't know how I got here, but I know whatever this is has taken over my life and I no longer have control over it. So I knew I was in a desperate place that I needed some type of inter intervention. And so, you know, accepting myself as a gay Christian and all of that, I even went as far as uh, about to marry a guy. So we were going to get married. You know, at that time, Obama had, uh, had uh, uh, legalized it but only certain states were honoring yeah. it. So, so we were going to move to a gay affirming state. We were gonna adopt a kid, adopt a dog, <clears throat> buy a house, the whole nine yards. And one night, the Holy Spirit just convicted me, plain and simple. He just convicted me about how I was living and that my life was not pleasing to God. And God told me that he has spared my life so many times, but this was my final chance to get delivered. And I said, my final chance to get delivered. And I thought about it. I said, if God is saying this is my final chance to be delivered, he's either saying that if I don't get delivered, I'm going to die in my sin. I said, or he's going to turn me over to a reprobate mind. I said, so either way, it's not a good deal 
So, you know, I said, Lord, you know, I, I, I want, I want your deliverance. And so the most amazing thing to me was that the first thing he told me was, you have to come out of the church because I have to deprogram you. And I was like, what? Yeah. I said, yeah. how? Yeah. I said, God, how in the world am I supposed to get delivered if I come out of the church? And what I realized is I was using the church as a band-aid, as a, as a, you know, yeah, pretty much as a band-aid. Because in those two or three hours of service, I felt good shouting and running around and crying. But that, that was church, no, that church was not an apostolic church, right? Uh, yeah, it, it was apostolic. Okay, were, was, were they preaching holiness and were they preaching against sin? Yeah, they're, they're preaching all of that. But, you know, nobody can make you do anything. But you can go to church. You can go to church 24 hours a day that your relationship with God is separate from your being involved in the church. So it had nothing to do with the church. It was where I was in my walk with God. But because a lot of times in our services, they're very emotional. I was getting an emotional fix from the service, but my life had no fruit of a or being born again. And so when he told me to come out of the church, he had to deprogram me. I was devastated because I said, the church is the only band-aid that I've had to give me a coping mechanism to make it through all of this stuff. So I just didn't understand how was I going to get free if I couldn't depend on the church. And what God had to reveal to me was I was just religious. I was just going through the motions, but I did not really know God in a true sense. And so what he told me was that, you know, I had to learn about intimacy, not church denomination, not church membership, but intimacy with God, knowing God for myself and how I was able to come out of all these things, God, God gave me a specific, a personalized deliverance plan. Like he told me to fast, he told me to pray, he told me to read my word. Even one day, he even told me to, to go in my closet. And you know, I've always been a fashionable guy. So when God said, go in your closet, I'm gonna go in my closet for what? And he said, as a man of God, you have to represent me and you have to look and carry yourself like a man. I said, okay. He said, so go in your closet. He said, anything that has a, a feminine kind of look to it or anything that has a unisex kind of look to it where a man or a woman can wear it, they get rid of it. So I'm just saying all this to say, God gave me a personalized uh, deliverance experience you know, not just in the sexual things, but everything concerning me, you know, even how I look. Because some people say holiness is not how you look, it's, it's how you live. Well, I believe it's both. You know, God tells us the standard is modesty. So with the modesty, men and women of God, we can't wear everything. We, we're not supposed to look like the world and take on the traditions, you know, and the customs of the world. So God even dealt with me, you know, in my wardrobe. But it was just amazing because, you know, I just felt so special because I realized that God himself, Holy Spirit himself, took the time, you know, to walk me through deliverance. And one of the things I asked God, I said, why did you take me this way around? And what he said was, he said, this major deliverance I didn't want anybody to get the credit. I wanted it to be a